So, Lynn, thank you uh, for spending time with us. Is there an update that you can accurately offer? So we were obviously really concerned last night when the communications went off. This is the third time that the communications have been cut off. And this really presents a challenge to us, not in terms of just providing updates, but delivering assistance. It becomes unsafe for us as humanitarians to try and deliver assistance throughout Gaza Strip, especially if there are airstrikes going on and there's no comms. And in terms of the humanitarian assistance you're trying to deliver, more more trucks are coming in. We only see the point where the trucks cross the border uh, into Gaza. What happens after that? What happens after those trucks go in? We have regular contact with the government of Israel, and we've made sure that the Israeli security concerns are addressed but balancing that with effective and efficient delivery of humanitarian assistance. So before the trucks go in, there's quite an extensive verification process. And then after they come in, they are transferred off of the trucks that they come in on. They're transferred onto another truck. There's surveillance by Israeli drones in terms of where the convoys go. So it's actually quite a complicated system um, that obviously results in, in some delays. As you know, you will sometimes hear questions or allegations that, well, the aid could be ending up in the hands of Hamas. So to those questions, what, what do you say? Yeah, we have a very sophisticated monitoring process within the United Nations, for, especially for high-risk items. And fuel is obviously a high-risk item because it can be used for a number of different things. So we do have a very extensive monitoring program to make sure that the num the volume of whatever happens to be, it can be fuel, it can be chemicals for the desalination plant, to make sure that that has gone to the destination and is used. Mm -hmm. So we actually, our monitoring mechanisms confirm that the materials were used for the purpose. But yet there continue to be suggestions that if the people of Gaza need fuel, they should just ask Hamas. Right. So uh, we, we're a humanitarian organization. Yeah. We need fuel, as I've said, not just for the desal plants, water, et cetera, the wastewater treatment plants, but for our trucks to actually deliver assistance. Um, so if Hamas has fuel, it doesn't mean we don't need fuel for our humanitarian operations. How often would you say, are, are, are you on the phone with the government of Israel trying to coordinate the humanitarian effort getting into Gaza? So I think I would like to say every minute of every day, there's somebody from the UN who's on the, uh, on the phone with the government of Israel. It is, it is continuous. It is throughout the day, throughout the night, sometimes at 3 a.m. in the morning. It is a continuous dialogue as I say, to try and balance and make sure that their security concerns are met, but that also that we can deliver humanitarian assistance where we need to deliver it as quickly and efficiently as possible. Israel is angry with the UN, has been for a very long time, very critical of, of the UN's work, of UNRWA's, UNRWA's work in particular, or critical of, of your work. How do you deal with that on a daily basis? Um, I think we know what we're doing. And you obviously have to be comfortable with that. We have seen 88 of our colleagues from UNRWA be killed in this crisis. They know that there's a good chance that there's not going to be enough money to pay their salaries towards the end of the year. And yet they are out there still delivering whatever they can to their communities, trying to make sure people just have access to water and maybe some bread or some dates. Um, and and really, it's 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 really just that that keeps you going. Um, and I guess a lot of self-reflection. Self-reflection. Yeah. You know, I do, w when you hear criticisms, you, you actually have to listen to them. Um, and you have to adjust your dial every now and then. Um, and so, Certainly, I think most of us who work here in Jerusalem, West Bank, or Gaza, I think we we know that the Palestinians require our support, in particular with respect to humanitarian assistance, and again, in particular, during this particular crisis. 
when you say adjust your dial, I mean, are, are, are you worrying that you might not be able to continue working there? I mean, we've seen some visas denied, right? So it, it, it is quite often something that's in the back of everybody who, back of the minds of everybody who works here because Israel is so vocal about the fact that they won't be renewing visas or they won't be issuing visas. They've said it very, very publicly. So, of course, it's always something that we always consider. Um, but uh, we certainly hope that it doesn't impact the work that we're doing. What sort of threat does Hamas pose to your workers? Because it's one thing to talk about uh, you make sure that the fuel gets to the salination, desalination plant and that it's, it's used appropriately. But along the way, our our you know, very angry, well-armed members of Hamas who want what you have. How are you ensuring that this doesn't end up in their hands? The United Nations works with everyone, right? From a humanitarian perspective. So right now, our assessment of the de facto authorities or Hamas is, is that they know they need us. They know that we're the only ones who are capable of delivering assistance. What we're concerned about is the loss of law and order as a result of the frustration from the population mm -hmm. boiling over because they don't have enough food, they don't have access to water, they can't get medical treatment, the sewage is running on the street, disease is breaking out. That's what we're concerned about. We are concerned about that we will lose credibility in the eyes of the population because we're not able to deliver. That's dangerous. It's very dangerous and we have seen some incidents very close to the tipping point over the past couple of weeks. Um, and that is one very, very good reason why the international community, including Egypt and Israel, need to let us bring in as much assistance as possible, because at some point it does become a law and order issue. Is there a red line in which you, you say to the staff in Gaza, stop, get out? Well. Um, they can't get out. Uh, we have 13,000 staff in Gaza and they won't be allowed out. And this gets back to there really not being any safe place to go. And a lot of staff say they would rather continue to deliver um, and just assume the risk as it is. There's a lot of moral dilemmas here. There's There's a lot of issues about how much can we accept in terms of um, the aid not flowing in quickly? How much can we accept in terms of where we deliver assistance? What about those people who are in the place you can't deliver? How do you prioritize? Hospital or school? Yeah. Which hospital? Mm -hmm. ICU? Cancer? It's these types of questions that are happening all the time and that all of our staff have to deal with every single day. Yeah, that's hard. That's hard. Lynn, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Yeah.